Galway Public Libraries welcome you to this year's Galway's Great Read, titled Westward Ho, A Ramble Through Galway, 1840 to 1950. The Great Read programme promotes our literary heritage, unique culture and history, and fosters an appreciation for its diversity and richness. This year, our programme is centred around the work of three travel writers, husband and wife team, Anna Maria Hall and Samuel, who visited County Galway several times prior to the Great Famine. Sir William Wilde, an extraordinarily interesting and intellectual man who wrote in the 1860s. And Richard Hayward, an actor, singer and musician turned travel writer, who explored the highways and byways of the county between the 1930s and the 1940s. We hope you enjoy this series of talks for Galway's Great Read 2021, Westward Ho, A Ramble Through Galway, 1840, 1950. We are delighted to welcome our guest today, Paul Clements, to this magnificent room in wonderful Ashford Castle. Paul is a literary journalist and author of numerous travel books, his most recent being Shannon Country, A River Journey Through Time, published in 2020. His other works include Wandering Ireland's Wild Atlantic Way, From Bamba's Crown to World's End, published in 2016, and Irish Shores, A Journey Around the Rim of Ireland. He is a contributing editor to the Rough Guide to Ireland and is also writes local history book reviews and Irishman's Diary for the Irish Times. He is a former BBC journalist, a fellow of Green Templeton College, Oxford and lives in Belfast. Paul's talk focuses on Galway's great read, third featured author, Richard Hayward. Hayward was one of Ireland's best loved cultural figures in the mid 20th century. He was a popular Irish travel writer, author and singer who led an intense and productive life, leaving behind a remarkable body of work through his writing and sound recordings. Paul's biography on Richard Hayward, Romancing Ireland, Richard Hayward, 1892 to 1964, was published in 2014 and later adapted for BBC television. Paul's talk today is titled, Richard Hayward, Galway and Connacht, and we do hope you enjoy. Hello everyone. Um, in the middle decades of the 20th century, Richard Hayward played a significant role in the culture landscape of Ireland. And for 40 years, he was a pivotal figure uh, as a travel writer, a singer, an actor and a filmmaker. Uh, he was also well known all over the country as a tour guide and a folklorist. Although he was born in Lancashire, Richard Hayward grew up on the coast of County Antrim. He became a lover of many parts of Ireland and was particularly fond of the West. Among his 11 travel books, two were on Connaught, while another one featured the Corrib region. Before exploring his connection to the West, it's worth just taking a brief look at some of his cultural activities. Hayward was uh, also a film star of his time and he produced feature films throughout Ireland in the 1930s. These included The Luck of the Irish, Irish and Proud of It, and The Early Bird. And this one broke box office records in Galway, Carlow and Kerry. The first DVD that we're going to see uh, sets the scene uh, really for him and features Richard Hayward in a number of different roles. It starts with a clip of one of his films called Devil's Rock, which was made on the North Antrim coast in 1936. Let them go, let them tarry, let them sink or let them swim. He doesn't care for me and I don't care for him. You can go and get another that I hope he will enjoy. But I'm going to marry a far nicer boy. You old hypocrite, you. You and your flowers and your courtship for young men and your hat pinned up at the sideways. I'm glad you took the pin out of your hat anyway. Who is she, eh? Who is she? Who is she? Uh, it's, a, it's a thing, a, a book, it's, it's neither a he nor a she. You're smart, aren't you? None of your shilly-shallying with me. Who is she? Ah, you're forever scout. If you come from Ireland, sure, it's a dear 
one must know that when we have the hoodie, it's a real old-fashioned show. For a hoodie's not a picnic, nor a party, nor a ball. For there's all these three together, and an open door for all. And not find a spot like the town of Coleraine. The boys and the girls never seem there to alter. It's go where you like, sure they're always the same. And if ever you're wanting a right hearty welcome, just come to the sweet little town of Coleraine. I'd roam through recreation, new comforts to find still. But the comfort I would seek the most, you all may understand, is to win the hand of Martha. She's the flower of sweet Strabane. <laughs> One day down in Bangor I called on Miss Brown She was up in her bath so she couldn't come down Says I slip on something and come down quick So she slipped on the soap and was down in a tick Tra la la, tra la lee Over six miles from Bangor to Donaghadee One day at the market I bought a wee hen I thought I would like a fresh egg now and then But the very next morning I got a great shock Says the hen I can't lay sure I'm only a cock Tra la la, tra la dee Only six miles from Bangor to Donaghadee One day I was walking down the main street I saw a wee lad with no shoes to his feet I took pity on him then and there and went into a fruit shop and bought him a pair. Tra la la, tra la lee, only six miles from Bangor to Donaghadee. I once met a man with a hole in his head. They took out my brain for to mend it, he said. That's awkward, says I, but says he not at all. Sure, I'm only a deputy up in the door. Tra la la, tra la lee. Only six miles from Bangor to Donaghadee. I met an old man at a funeral one day. His back it was stooped and his hair it was grey. I'm close on a hundred, he said with a groan. Faith as I, you'd be wasting your time to go home. Tra la la, tra la lee. Over six miles from Bangor to Donaghadee. I dreamt I did die and to heaven did go. And the place that I came from they wanted to know. Says I, I'm from Bangor, St. Peter did stare. Hurry up. Step inside, you're the first one from there. Tra la la, tra la lee. Over six miles from Bangor to Donaghadee. Richard Hayward's travel books are filled with cultural history and with folklore, legends and stories about the people that he met and from his research and his wide reading too. His first book on the West was The Corrib Country, published in 1943, after he had made several trips involving prolonged stays at Ashford Castle. He got to know the new owner, Noel Huggard, in 1941 and he became friendly with his family. So Hayward toured the area with the artist James Humbert Craig. He was a distinguished landscape painter 
and he had already enjoyed a fruitful collaboration with him for his first travel book in praise of Ulster in 1938, which was a very popular book uh, when it came out. So the watery light and the landscape and the lakes um, of the Corrib area appealed to Craig's artistry and his 38 wash drawings included the Mamturk Mountains, bogs, turf cutters, farmers and fishermen at work, as well as Kong Abbey and Cross. Uh, the gods of the Neil, Ashford Castle and Loch Mask House where Captain Boycott had lived. Hayward knew the value of stories from older people and one of his ploys was to arrive in a village and ask around for the oldest person. They always had a hinterland and they had good stories. So through a contact with the priest, Father Neary, he met an old man called David Carney in Kong and he compiled a list of craftsmen and traders from the early 1860s which by that stage uh, in the early 40s was going back 80 years or more so it's a, it's a great resource um, to include that in his book and he drew in the work of the 19th century antiquarian Sir William Wilde the author of Loch Corrib, its shores and islands. Uh, Hayward followed in Wilde's footsteps visiting a triangular patch of land known as Moitura Conga, north of Kong, uh, where he delves into a Bronze Age burial mound, um, a one-man cairn that Wilde had explored. And Wilde uncovered a decorated clay urn with the ashes of a cremated warrior in whose memory it was raised. And the urn was later donated to the Royal Irish Academy. And Hayward quotes the 19th century poetry of James Clarence Mangan and of William Rooney. And he refers to a contemporary poet, Morris Farley, whose poem, The Last Stronghold, he had not been able to get out of his head for several days. So if there is a leitmotif um, in Corrib country, then it's the inscription on memorial stones, churches and monuments. Everywhere that he goes, Hayward noted their wording. He would copy down the lettering um, carefully in his journal and in the old Kilmaine estate when he surveyed a six-sided stone structure known as the Temple of the Gods of the Neil. He became very frustrated at the length of time that it took him trying to decipher the inscription on the plaque erected on the folly by Lord Kilmaine. It is nothing, he wrote, more than one of those ornamental faradiddles which noblemen of the 18th century seem to have considered necessary to the adornment of any self-respecting domain. A more absurd conglomeration of unrelated objects never confronted the eyes of man. Above this farrago of nonsense is a smaller plinth into which are inset what are most likely three grotesques, plundered from some ruined medieval church in the neighbourhood. Surmounting this amazing piece of monumental foolery is a still smaller plinth topped with a pointed finial and exhibiting round three of its four sides an inscription mainly in Gothic characters, but to which he said I was foolish enough to devote many maddening hours in an attempt to produce some intelligible translation or explanation. After his journey, Hayward tried to pin down the exact wording and he consulted R.A.S. McAllister, then President of the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland, and Brendan Adams, who was a Northern philologist. And he brought rubbings made for him by Peter Foy and two experts who helped fill in the missing letters. Hayward felt that he had cracked most of the inscription, but he concluded, who composed the lengthy and absurd main inscription and what information, if any, he was trying to impart to succeeding generations is something entirely beyond my comprehension. So in his Corrib book, Hayward included eight sketches of Galway, devoting 15 pages to the city at the end of the book. But this was really just a foretaste of what was to come in his later books of travel. In the 1940s, he embarked on a series of five topographical books on Ireland. So there was one each on Ulster, Munster and Leinster and two on Connaught because he felt there was enough material for separate volumes on the Western province. The first of these, Connaught and the City of Galway, was published in 1952, while the second was named after the other four counties, Mayo, Sligo, Leitrim, Roscommon, and came out in 1955. Both books were published by the London firm of Arthur Barker. At this stage, Hayward had signed up a new artist called Raymond Piper, whom he had met through the Belfast Naturalist Field Club, and they had worked, uh, he had worked with him on the Ulster and Leinster books. Uh, 
So by the time they went off on their western journey, the Hayward Piper collaboration was fairly well established. And after a summer tour, they returned home, took a break and then headed off again in Hayward's trusty Singer 12 as two carefree spirits in September to explore Galway City in considerable detail. The two men spent the autumn covering 8,000 miles and driving all over Connacht as well. At times it was quite hard going. The single track roads were rutted and very dusty, especially in dry weather, and the notebook entries moan about the rain. The first of these two Connacht books deals with Galway city and county and includes the Aran Islands as well as Loch Corrib. The book contains 56 delicate pencil sketches by Raymond Piper. 19 of them are devoted to the city and the remaining 37 are of the county. Hayward began by outlining a broad brush stroke of Connacht, writing of its heritage, geology and landscape. He then delved into the history of Galway itself, describing it as the most Irish of all cities. And the two men walked the streets with Piper sketching his half-tone pencil drawings of alleyways such as Kerwin's Lane and Buttermilk Lane, as well as major buildings. Hayward loved folklore and legend, but his chief delight was looking at the built heritage. Lynch's castle, he said, was the one single example today that really gives us anything approaching a picture of what the city must have looked like before the curse of Cromwell fell upon it. He closely examined the facades of many of these buildings, uh, discussing architectural oddities such as gargoyles, um, but he complained about the lack of interest in protecting the built heritage. And he said, apart from the church of St Nicholas, there has been an appalling disregard for beauty and tradition, which is perhaps more apparent in Ireland than in any other country of the civilised world. I have frequently bemoaned this utter lack of public tastes in my fellow countrymen, this dreadful vulgarity which fills our fairest and most sacred ruined abbeys with tombs of an ugliness that must be seen to be believed. So although he celebrated many aspects of uh, local life throughout Ireland, Hayward was frequently outspoken about what he saw as the lack of civic pride. And on his travels generally around Ireland, he found little interest in preserving buildings. It's worth saying, of course, that Ireland was a young country. Uh, there wasn't a lot of money to be spent on preserving four or five hundred year old castles in those days. But for all his criticism, uh, there were many aspects of Galway that he cherished and he appreciated its historic past. As he walked the streets and the lanes, he drank in the atmosphere and he found that Lynch's castle was the most interesting specimen of domestic architecture standing in the city. He also spent time in St Nicholas's Church, which he described as easily the most important ecclesiastical building in the city of the tribes, and one of the most notable in the whole of Ireland. And within itself is virtually the whole history of Galway in stone. Their walking tour brought them to the Irish language theatre of Tyviark, where Piper produced a line drawing of the interior of the building, as well as the Spanish arch. When he reached the Salmon Weir Bridge, the birds were melodious that day, singing in full-throated happy consort with the tumbling, tinkling waters. Hayward met Tom Keneally, who had worked for many years at the eel fishery, and he provided him with information about their spawning and their long journey to the Sargasso Sea. Further along, he was impressed with University College, which he called a delightfully informal place. At the college, he met two of his friends, Professors Liam O'Brien and Michael Dugnan, as well as Professors Donovan O'Sullivan and James Mitchell. Hayward often deferred to local on-the-ground experts for help with historical detail. Uh, he couldn't possibly have known all this information, so he relied on local people. And at the same time, then, Raymond Piper was busy sketching a full-page drawing of the college. And Hayward wrote off it, it is particularly satisfying to look upon and its compact design seems to breathe a fitting harmony with the comparatively small population which it serves so well. Hayward's books were eagerly anticipated by readers throughout Ireland and indeed further afield. By the early 1950s, Kenny's bookshop, then in Shop Street, had chalked up respectable sales of his Corrib country and promoted his first Connaught book. 
Uh, Des Kenny remembers his mother Maureen, who ran the business, talking about Hayward's visits during the 1940s and 50s, when he used to come in and look around, and he would plunder the bookshelves for information, and would spend quite a long time in the shop. Uh, looking for details and little tidbits that, that he wanted to illuminate his own books with and asking questions about Galway and checking on, on other sources. Speaking about uh, Hayward's visit years later, um, Des Kenny recalled um, Hayward's time coming into the shop. And he said, I remember my mother telling me later that they had chatted. Hayward would walk down to the Wolf Tone Bridge and look over the corb. Frequently she spoke about him and said he used to stare into the river for hours and she often wondered what he was thinking about. She never understood why he did that, although he may have been taking notes and deliberating on his writing. His books sold very well in the shop and his writing, which was anecdotal and historical, was very popular. I would describe his work as a cross between a journalist and a serious writer. It was after Hayward's death, as well as the deaths of Brendan Bain, Kate O'Brien and Austin Clark, that we decided in the late 1960s to start a picture gallery of authors, as we realised we did not have anything to remember them by. So apart from his travel books and his film career, Hayward was also a noted singer, and he recorded with Decca and HMV. And there's another West of Ireland connection uh, through the singer Delia Murphy, who came originally from Clare Morris. Hayward had heard her singing at a meeting of the Irish Pen Group in Jury's Hotel Dublin in 1937 and one of his jobs was uh, to act as a talent scout for Decca Records and he immediately signed her up after hearing her singing and with her strong accent and her distinctive singing voice uh, Delia performed Three Lovely Lassies, a song that he especially enjoyed. Um, Delia had been educated in Chewham as well as in Dublin and at the University College Galway, where she gathered and learned tunes from various sources. One of those sources was Porrig O'Connor, whom Hayward called a fine Irish writer and storyteller. And this sketch of the statue was drawn by Raymond Piper and is from the Connaught book. As she wandered around the Clala, Delia heard seafaring songs from the washerwomen and the fishermen, who had brought them back from other ports and uh, she and Hayward went on together to form a very successful four-year partnership, developing a synergy between them and singing all over the country. Um, Delia's best-known song was The Spinning Wheel, written in the 19th century, but along with Hayward they sang duets on Radio Erin, including If I Were a Blackbird, The Rose of Moon Coin, The Bantry Girl's Lament, and The Bright Silvery Light of the Moon. And one of the best loved of all the songs, which they performed together, was called What Will You Do, Love? What will you do, love, when I am going With white sails flowing, the seas beyond? What will you do, love, when the waves divide us and friends may chide us for being fond. The waves divide us, and friends may chide us. In faith abiding, I'll still be true. And I'll pray for you on the stormy ocean. In deep devotion, that's what I do. What would you do, love, if distant tidings Your fond confiding should undermine And I abiding neath bright stars shining Thought other eyes were as bright as thine One oh, name it not for the guilt and sorrow Where thy What would you do, love, if home returning 
with hopes high burning and wealth for you. My good bark, which bounded o'er seas unsounded, were lost and foundered. What would you do? So the world spared love, I placed them all in wanton sorrow that left me you. And I'd welcome thee from the westing billow, this heart thy pillow, that's what I'd do. The waves divide us, and friends may chide us, our love will guide us, will still be true, and through stormy Richard Hayward had a connection to The Quiet Man, uh, filmed in Kong in 1951, and his musical arrangement of The Humour Is On Me Now was used in the film. It was based on a story written by Morris Walsh, who was a great friend of Hayward's. He reviewed his travel books for the Irish Times and wrote the foreword to three of them. The Hayward publicity machine was given another shot in the arm during a break in the filming when an elegant Maureen O'Hara was photographed relaxing in a chair with a copy of The Coral Country. It's an enduring image of the star. We don't know if they ever met or not. Uh, they may have done, and Hayward perhaps uh, gave her a copy, just especially to get a, a good publicity image. So his second book, um, Mayo, Sligo, Leitrim and Roscommon, his second Connacht book, was published in 1955 and was a companion volume to the Galway book three years earlier. Mayo was the launching point for his journey around the four counties. Uh, he began in Kong, which had been familiar to him from his Corrib stay nearly 15 years beforehand, and he embarked on a boat trip with Raymond Piper on Loch Mask before moving on to Ackill Island. They based themselves at the Amethyst Hotel in Kiel, where he had a cosy room filled with the endearing, nostalgic fragrance of turf smoke, the loveliest odour in all the world. Ackle was a poor place in those days with very few jobs. Many islanders went to work picking potatoes in Scotland or in the building trade in England, returning in the summer for a few weeks to help cut hay and turf. Homes were lit by paraffin lamps and candles, while heat and energy for cooking came from turf fires and ranges. Uh, this Piper sketch shows Ackle Head and Crohan on the west side of the island. In his work, Hayward showed his fondness for invoking other writers, who included the publisher Edward Newman from London, writing in 1838, and Samuel and Anna Maria Hall. The Hall's celebrated book, The West and Connemara, Handbooks for Ireland, was published in 1853. So Hayward was now following in their footsteps a um, 100 years uh, after their visit and walking through the forlorn houses of the deserted village on the side of Slavemore Mountain. In the Hall's day, they noted that the houses were inhabited, and he quotes from their book, Their houses were heaps of rude stones, uncemented, rounded at the gables, roofed with fern, heath and shingles, fastened on by straw bands. And although he enjoyed walking on Ackle, Hayward was appalled at what he called the vicious devastation that he found at the deserted village. He felt that the people of the island seemed to have small regard for their monuments of antiquity, a regard which is not greatly developed in the Irish people as a whole, and many of the Ackle megaliths have been ruthlessly taken apart for the provision of materials to build houses, sheep shelters and walls. There was very little that uh, didn't interest Richard Hayward. The boats and the quays fascinated him, ancient customs intrigued him, Old graveyards too were favourite haunts, and lost names in history, and stories such as those involving Fighting Fitzpatrick and Grace O'Malley all fed his writing mill. Frequently he stopped at roadside shrines and holy wells, although he was somewhat unimpressed with what he found in Knock. 
The ugly assemblage of untidy wooden stalls and shacks, loud with advertisements and tawdry trimmings, the raucous loudspeakers and the long lines of chromium-plated taps from which holy water is dispensed in a kind of production line seem to me to be far removed from any seemly spirit of Christian devotion. Hayward loved nothing better than a good hike into the hills, relishing the opportunity of tramping the bogs and tackling the peaks. And he nourished readers with the idea of the freedom that the hills offered because they were great places to drink in the landscape and just um, look at the countryside in detail and it gave Piper opportunities for sketches obviously as well. So along with, Pepper, he, uh, with Raymond Piper he climbed the dreamy unforgettable cone of Crookpatrick but they did not linger long at the summit as they were pestered by a plague of shield bugs, which he said had obviously taken to the air in vast squadrons for our special annoyance. After descending Crowpatrick to Campbell's pub, Hayward discovered that his really stout veldtschoen was so badly cut uh, and worn that he had to sit in the nearest cobblers, whilst new soles and heels were stitched and battered into place. On the way to Sligo, he diverted to tour the back roads around Loch Talt and wrote of his love for them. For the green roads of Ireland ever tug at my heart, and I never tire of exploring their withdrawn beauty, nor of seeking out their hidden or forgotten history. As mentioned, uh, Hayward was a great lover of Galway, and he was a regular visitor to the Oyster Festival in the late 1950s and early 60s. He enjoyed socialising and meeting all sorts of people and um, at this event in particular and he's pictured here with other guests in the October issue of Social and Personal magazine, enjoying an Irish coffee. Uh, there are a couple of other pictures from this time and these um, feature the guests of honour in the Clada coach at the Oyster Festival in 1963 and they include Richard Hayward, Brian Collins, Martin de Ville, the Mayor of Galway and the Spanish Ambassador to Ireland. The next photograph is from the Irish Times from September 1961. In the picture on the right hand side, the man on the left of that photograph is Charlie Hawhey, while Hayward is seen in the left hand picture. And this is him again entering into the spirit of festivities at the Oyster Festival in September 1961 and Hayward is pictured second right. Besides writing travel books, Hayward led tour groups all over Ireland through his involvement with the Belfast Naturalist Field Club. He was the president of the club in 1951. Uh, he was also a collector of dialect words and was involved throughout the 1950s in the fullest survey ever held of Ulster dialect words and other general Irish um, dialect words too and phrases, the first one that was ever published, um, which came out in later years. So this is a group of field club members heading off to Sligo in Easter 1961 for a trip conducted by Hayward. If you wanted to go on one of these weekend trips, and he ran, he ran them for 17 years every Easter, then you had to book a seat on the bus or the train by Christmas. Uh, they were very popular tours, and women especially loved his company. They I've talked to a couple of people who've been on these tours and they fought to get sitting beside him on the bus of the train because they loved his company and they enjoyed hearing his stories and, you know, a bit of crack and playing the harp at night as well. Uh, this is another shot of the group leaving for the Berlin in Easter 1956. Some of the people on it may not have been overly interested in the archaeological sites of the Berlin or uh, the glacial erratics, the big boulders that are found all over it, or indeed the location of the gentians, the orchids, or the dryas octopetala, which Hayward would have been able to identify because he genned up on all that knowledge of the flora. But uh, as one man um, said who was on these trips, what he didn't know, he made up if the experts hadn't made it up before he did. So um, he had a very good working knowledge of everything and that, that was part of the weekend and the trip, just to throw in a bit of fun as well. Apart from the feature films of the 1930s, Hayward also made documentary films, including one about the Corrib, based on his journey through the area in the early 1940s, and another one on the Shannon, called Where the River Shannon Flows, which tied in with his book being published in 1940, following his journey down the river in 1939. The second DVD that we're going to see now is an interview with Richard Hayward and his artist friend Raymond Piper, who illustrated all his books in the series called This Is Ireland. 
and he's speaking at the Galway Oyster Festival in 1962 about his new and final book called Munster and the City of Cork, which was published in 1964. And they're being interviewed on RTE television. And the interviewer is Al Byrne, who was the brother of Gay Byrne. And it starts off with Hayward on the harp playing the Inniskillen Dragoon, which was the regiment's march. Mr. Richard Hayward quietly singing a little song and playing his harp in the corner. Now we know more about that, more about Mr. Hayward than that. We talked to him about a new book he's just bringing out on Ireland. Mr. Hayward, would you like to talk to us about your new book? I'd be delighted to talk to you about anything. Good. <laughs> well, now let's start on the book. Yes. No. What, what's no, it all about? No oysters. No more Guinness. No shabli. Well, not at the moment. Just talk. We, yes. Very just dry. For the very dry subject. All right. Well, now the book is called uh, Munster and the City of Cork and it deals with the province of Munster and the six counties of Munster. From what point of view? Well, from historical point of view, from the point of view of uh, antiquities in the region, uh, very much topography to any sort of intelligent tourist coming over, you know, he wants to know things about the country, this will be in the book. How long has it take, taken you to write this book? Nearly two years. It's a very long book. Living in Cork all the time? Oh, no. I, I'm sorry. I wasn't. No. No, I wasn't. I, Why not? I'd love to do that, you know. You would. From yes. choice. <laughs> yes, I love Cork. It's a lovely city. Good. Yes. Mr. Raymond Piper, yes, you're sir. illustrating Mr. Hayward's yes, book. What, what have you chosen as illustrations? Well, we chose between the two of us. We went around the country from point to point, which had made the plans, and we found a certain interesting article or a place, and we sketched it if the weather permitted, of course. Now, what sort of places did you, in fact, sketch? Mostly historical, topographical, things that were important to Munster in general, Such most as? important buildings, old castles, cromlechs, people and places. All right, tell us about some of them now in particular. Uh, well, for instance, we'd like to say the uh, Rock of Cashel. Firstly, on arriving there, we found my bank manager had signed the book before us, and I sketched the thing towards sunset, he wasn't there then, and finished off with Cormac's Chapel, which took about six hours with the hops and stops between rain showers and sunshine. How long does it take you to make one of these illustrations? Sometimes an hour, sometimes half an hour, sometimes 20 minutes, sometimes even less, and up to even six to eight hours. Mr. Hayward, are you pleased, Mr. Piper, to illustrate your book? You, you, you've taken them on, Mr. Ray. Otherwise, you wouldn't be illustrating them. I see. Uh, this is, I think, the seventh book that Raymond has illustrated for me. And you're happy and with them? Oh, very happy. You, you think he's showing promise? We get on awfully well together. He never drinks my drink or any unfriendly <laughs> thing like that. <laughs> Mr. Piper, do you have to live in Cork to get the, the atmosphere before you can illustrate? Well, as a matter of fact, the atmosphere to an island comes very easily to me. I'm very fond of it. So I, after I've gone to Belfast. When will your book come out, Mr. Hayward? In the spring of uh, next year. How much will in it be? March. Oh. <laughs> Sorry about well, the money, but how much will well, it be? Uh, We're very it, practical it, here. No, it'll be three guineas. Three guineas? That's 63 shillings. So you start saving up now, it won't be so bad. But what sort, what sort of people do you think is going, they're going to read this book? And if three guineas is too much, I'll autograph it for you, and that'll cost you another guinea. That's what I was afraid of. What <laughs> sort of people do you think are going to read this book? Oh, I think it's, a, it's a, of general interest to everybody. It's being published in London by Phoenix House. Will you have and British and Irish readers? I and American. And oh, Americans. Yes. You think it's going to be a success? Oh, no. 
I hope so. I wouldn't like to spend two years in something I didn't believe in, you know. The you publisher thinks so. I'm quite sure, so. yes, otherwise I wouldn't do it. Mr. Piper and Mr. Yes. Hayward, maybe thank you very much for entertaining us and talking to us both. It's very kind of you. Very versatile people. Indeed. I would like to tell you about one of my harps at home. I've got a collection. One of them's very old and it's got an inscription right down the front of the fourth pillar. And what does it say? It says, Goncher Miro August Inge Sohor. May you never want a string while there's guts in an Englishman. Thank you very much indeed, Bob. So that interview brings Hayward alive in a completely different way. Uh, you can see that he was a force of nature and he brought laughter and happiness wherever he went. And that's what I was told by many people who knew him over the years. I never met him personally, but I did know Raymond Piper um, quite well. And he was much younger and he encouraged me to take an interest in Hayward and to write about him because he felt he had been woefully neglected. Um, Richard Hayward was one of the best known um, men, really, and writers and uh, actors in Ireland. And um, he was tragically killed in a car crash in 1964, in which two other people were killed. In fact, just um, a couple of weeks after his final monster book had come out. And I always think it's a bit ironic for someone who spent the best part of 40 years travelling all around the back roads of Ireland um, to meet his end in such a sad way. But um, I once asked Raymond Piper um, about you know, how they got on because they, they specifically had 17 years off and on, maybe two or three months at a time, visiting um, different parts of Ireland. And I asked them how they got on. And Raymond Piper said on um, this on one occasion, he replied by saying, we used to row like hell at times, as good friends do. Paul, thank you so much for that wonderful, detailed, insightful talk on Hayward. We thoroughly enjoyed it and we hope you did too. Many thanks to Paul also for the wonderful memorabilia he brought with him today and the wonderful collection of books. Among the wonderful material that Paul brought along today, we have this beautiful stoneware jug on Krushkin Lawn, made by Richard Piper, depicting Hayward's image and presented by Piper to Paul many years ago. It's a beautiful piece and you can see Hayward's character in the jug and apparently it once held whiskey, but no longer. Also, we would like to thank everybody here in Ashford Castle for hosting us today. We've had a fantastic experience here and what better place, these wonderful surroundings. So thank you to them also. And thank you, we hope you enjoyed.